Hello. Is it on? Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm Kelly Hodgins. I'm from the Errol Food Institute at the University of Guelph. We're a center for um, research, innovation, and uh, science communication around food and agriculture topics. Um, we try to be, or we are, um, objective, evidence-based, and just really trying to as much as possible and as, and as many times as possible hold space for dialogue around really important and pertinent topics in our food system, food, food sustainability, food waste, um, food, all kinds of topics. So I personally come from uh, an agriculture background, conventional dairy farming, but then for the past 10 years been organic, small scale organic farming on the coast of BC. Um, so I kind of bring both perspectives there. So I guess um, I'm kind of the hippie of the panel, perhaps. Um, <laughs> so I really want to hear um, your guys' perspectives. I'm really looking forward to sort of hearing some challenging conversations, some challenging um, questions, and really want to invite all of your perspectives. So thanks for having me. Um, and I'm going to bring up the rest of the panel. Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying. Uh, can I do my little post thing before we lose anybody else? So, uh, again, just by a show of hands, can we get the house lights up? Just another kiss, if you don't mind. That's a technical term. Is it coming up? Okay, okay there we go. So, again, just by a show of hands, after the film, how many people still have concerns for their, their own safety or the safety of the planet based on the current GMOs, as we said many times in the film, case by case, by the current GMOs on the market? Okay, quite a few less. Now, how many people feel that the farmers in a countries like Uganda and Kenya should have the right to choose GMO technology to help fix a problem like banana wilt. Does anybody feel those farmers shouldn't have that right? Nobody? Okay, thank you very much. I can go now. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Swag, this is called swag, everybody. Cool GMO technology swag. Hollywood, Hollywood. Okay. <laughs> Is it, uh, is it in the way of us? Can you guys see us? No, they can see us. Okay. I'll be quiet now. No, no, um, yeah. So I was, I was going to introduce these guys, but I, I would rather you guys introduce yourselves. I think that's nicer. Um, so I'm oh, Scott. Have, okay, okay, great. Cool. They've, seen, they've seen enough okay. of me. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker. This is my fourth film. I'm the producer, writer, director, co-editor, co-DP. And I started in music videos. Anybody remember Jimmy Cliff's I Can See Clearly Now? You can see the direct line from that short music video to this. I mean, it's just inevitable. Okay, I'm a little punchy. Here we go. Go ahead. My name's Carol Culhane. I'm a professional home economist. I have an undergraduate degree in food science and nutrition. I have an MBA and a certificate in international food law from Michigan State University. I have worked in the food industry for 40 years. I started the year I graduated, which was 1978. And I operate a company called International Food Focus, and we provide regulatory compliance services as well as market assessments and evaluations for the food industry. And I'm pleased to be here this evening, so thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm a member of IFT. She's, she's also an IFT member, which if you didn't see at the end of the film who, who funded the film, and we can talk about that, and it's also on our website. Yes, I'm a food science communicator for food IFT, which is a Chicago-based uh, industry, uh, sorry, a Chicago-based organization devoted to the food science and technology objectives. Thank you. Uh, my name is Motlati Musi. I'm a farmer from South Africa. Uh, GM grain, 
producer, as well as livestock and other types of grains such as uh, uh, beans, not soy beans only, but uh, other edible beans for, as well as uh, 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 grass feed for animals. I've been into farming since the very young age, around <coughs> 10, 11 years old, I was already into commercial farming as a laborer. But with New South Africa, I own land. I own 21 hectares of land in South Africa. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Greg Hannum. I'm a crop farmer in the Guelph area, so that's uh, with no traffic, 45 minutes east of here. <laughs> Usually about an hour and a half drive, though. Uh, so I grow corn, wheat, and soybeans. I grow both uh, GM crops and non-GMO crops uh, on my farm. I kind of make those decisions based on uh, on what I need to do and what the field uh, preparations and and and, uh, and the rest of my cropping system needs. Uh, and we're, we're a fifth generation farm, uh, family farm on the uh, the current location that we're at. Uh, my family farm before that, but uh, you know when you move, uh, you know 100 miles away, 100 years ago, you don't bring any documentation with you. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and, and would uh, gladly answer any questions. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Ian Affleck. I'm the executive director of Plant Biotechnology for Crop Life Canada. So Crop Life Canada is a trade association. We represent, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the manufacturers and distributors of the products that you, they're talking about in the film. So Monsanto is one of my members, if you're wondering who I am. Um, but uh, I'm just here to speak to the science that's, uh, that's in the film. I studied agriculture in Nova Scotia, um, studied at the University of Guelph, grew up on a potato farm in PEI, um, worked for the government as a regulator for about 10 years, and then now work in the industry in uh, both science, policy, and communication. So thank you all for, for being here tonight to, to, to get more information on this topic and to stick around for the panel discussion to hear from these other people who you're probably more interested in than me. So thanks again. Amazing. Thank you. Delighted to share the stage with you guys. Um, before we begin, I also just want to acknowledge the, the land that we're on right now um, and its traditional keepers. So um, as we're talking about food lands and, and, and farmlands um, and sustainability within our food system, it's really important to recognize that this land has been occupied for 15,000 years, um, specifically in this place by the Huron-Wendat the Patoon, Seneca, and most recently the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nations. Um, so today the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island or Canada, um, and we're grateful to have uh, the opportunity to meet and to work and to discuss um, and on this on this space. So. Um, so for the next sort of hour or, or so, um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you um, and really turning the conversation to you. You've been listening for a long time and I really want to hear your perspectives and I think we all do. Um, so we're going to, the process for this is that we've got microphones here and here. So if you feel comfortable um, coming up to the microphone to ask your question, we, we warmly invite that. Uh, alternatively, if you're a little bit shy or you're a little bit stuck in the middle, you can write a question on a piece of paper and hand that down the aisle, um, and Andy there will grab it from you, and that's an alternative. We're right here too. Okay, we'll be looking for you guys to give your questions. So either way, but um, really just want to encourage lots of different perspectives, lots of different opinions, and lots of uh, conversation. And as you can see, we've got a pretty broad um, sort of diversity in, in expert voices here, so hopefully we'll be able to, to answer some of those. Um, and I, I guess also we're just we're going to try to keep it to one question per person and try to try to really keep your question concise so that we can get through multiple different. Keep, uh, keep your question a question. Keep your question to a question. No, not a not a, <laughs> no rant. Not a speech. Well, while we're waiting for somebody to get the nerve, I'll also, if anybody would like to see more of Musi, uh, one of the scenes that was heartbreaking to cut from the film was this incredibly long scene of him having lunch with John and Zira in South Africa, who John and Zira would identify himself as an agroecologist farmer. 
they would you know, on on paper you would call them on opposite sides of the spectrum on on GMOs, and they had this incredibly kind and articulate and humble conversation about GMOs and farming in Africa and being a parent and all that. And it's on the Food Evolution uh, Facebook page, and I, I, I highly recommend you guys check that out. It was a great, great pleasure to film it, and a shame not to have it in the film. But thank goodness for zeros and ones, and we can share it through the. Uh, the beauty of the interwebs. Okay, I see some questions being written. Question? And already questioned at the All mic. Right. Please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Mark Linus spoke in the film. He said, we're trying to build a more sustainable farming system. And so to our farmers on the panel, what would that look like for you? Okay, uh, farming is not, uh, we must I start by saying is a sustainable profession, not as a subsistence uh, occupation. So in order for us in Africa to make profits out of farming and be able to send our children to school, we need to make profits. And uh, with technology, it is very sustainable. Hope I've answered you. Yeah, and I would agree that uh, when we talk about sustainability, there's lots of other environmental things that come to mind, but I think that's an important point that sustainability, actually, part of it is you need to be uh, you know, financially viable to carry on. Your business needs to be sustainable. Um, from where I sit and where I farm, uh, the one luxury I have being in Canada and, and, and the type of operation I have, I have access to all the tools that exist. So whether they be a GMO tool, an organic tool, a conventional tool for growing crops, I have access to all of those and I can utilize that. So what I can do in, in my operation is make the, the best decision for each piece of land uh, or each crop that I'm growing and pick what tools make sense uh, to, to reduce the amount of inputs I need to grow that crop increase my, my uh, production or increase my profitability off that acre and then make sure that the land uh, that, I, that I produce it on is actually, you know, if I can, in better shape than it was uh, last year. So, so um, and sometimes that's a hard balance to make, you know, make, keep my, make my land better than it was the year before and increase my profitability and, and, and production on that land. But that's the balance that we try and work with is take all those tools and try and put them together in a way that that's, uh, that that's, what, we, that's what our end result would be. Uh, so it's a really complicated uh, thing to think about sustainability, um, uh, but I, it, it's uh, actually you know kind of fun and, and it's kind of a nice puzzle to try and put together. All right. Can you hear me with this? Yes. All right, great. Um, so one idea that was touched on the film was that there was a gap in information about GMOs when they first came onto the market, and therefore some sources filled the information, information gap themselves. What information was available? to the public when GMOs first came out? And if done again, what should have been done differently to fill in these gap informations, these gap informations? Yeah, as the, or, sorry. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, there was a person who was very active, let's say, involved in um, the dissemination of information of genetically modified crops in the 90s. And his name is Thomas Hoban. Uh, he he's a sociologist, a risk communication expert from um, Northern Carolina University. And actually, he was contracted by Monsanto and a few other companies to help them um, inform the public that this technology was being commercialized. The odd thing was nobody listened to him. And uh, he was a person who was very in favor of this technology, and he was vilified by a number of groups for even being in favor of the technology. Now, remember, he's not a life scientist. He's a, really a social scientist. He came to Canada uh, a number of times, but there was just something that the Monsantos of the world just seemed to have a blind ear or eye to how to communicate this technology. In fact, I remember hearing one particular public relations company say, it's almost like they have a genetic defect. <laughs> that they, yes, they are the experts in um, uh, uh, genetic technology, but they weren't experts in communication. The odd thing was that they would reach out to these people and just sit there and nod and... So um, there, there, was, there was a gap. 
uh, this debate of labeling or not labeling. And I was always in favor of labeling. And yet there were people in the life science, also a member of Life Sciences Ontario, saying, shh, don't, don't say that. And there was this one very um, prominent scientist who said to me one day, he said, Carol, I have so much respect for your, your research, but I really wish you'd change some of your opinions. Because <laughs> I was in favor of labeling. This is so wonderful. Why don't we tell people where it is? And I wasn't the only person who felt that way. Anyway, that argument was lost, and um, labeling being something to sort of vilify rather than to identify the product. Um, but then we really didn't, we haven't heard very much about genetically modified for many years. Now it's been 20 years now that it's been, it was 1994 that the Flavor Saver Tomato came out. So now we are hearing more about it. I also feel that and can see that some of the applications have very strong consumer, consumer benefits. So it is initiatives like this, this particular film, which is changing the dialogue. But I also believe there are always going to be a groups, groups of people who are just not comfortable with anyone changing any genetic makeup of anything. And I, I'm just going to say, get used to it. That's the way it's going to be. Because, it's, like I say, not everyone is going to be comfortable with it. Maybe I can add to that from an industry point of view when you say what, what happened at the beginning. And I think, I think you're completely right. There was... Um, some effort made to try to speak out to the public, but not nearly enough by the companies that, for example, my member companies, we, we botched this 20 years ago. And what, what happened was, as you said, we weren't, we weren't very good at PR. We weren't very good at explaining what our products were. What we were good at identifying was who our customers were. And the companies identified the customers as the Gregs of the world. We sell seeds to you, so we're going to explain to you why it works. And it's not our job to talk to the public. We'll put a little bit of money into it. We'll make an effort. Oh, that didn't go well. Okay, we're going to leave that alone. So what, we, what the companies did really well is they spoke to the 2 to 3% of people in the world that grow food, and they didn't really end up speaking at all to the rest of the 97% of the world that eats the food. So what that left is someone who was opposed to the technology that was willing to speak to the other 97% basically had the conversation all to themselves. So we, we just weren't, we weren't there. We didn't do enough. We're, we're trying to do better now. And we've realized that although our primary customers are the farmers, nobody else necessarily is going to take on, like a, a superstore is not going to take on the job to educate the public on the science behind every different production methodology that goes into all the different foods that are on the shelf. They, they couldn't do it. There's too many different production techniques. So we as an industry have to do a better job of getting information to the consumer and being more transparent and being available for discussions. And I think we're making an effort to do that now, but I think we're still learning how to get good at it. I, th I still think it's, as you said, it's not in our DNA. <laughs> so we're still, we're still learning how to and, communicate. And, and listening to the experts. Yeah. And if I could draft off that a, a little bit as a, as a, as a father, as a consumer of food and, and, a, and a journalist and a filmmaker, some other pieces that were very interesting to me that didn't make it into the film were the fact that GMO technology was on the table when the USDA was considering the rules for organic certification. And there were some in the organic industry that, sorry, in the natural foods industry at that point, there were, the organic industry was still coming up, that said no to that. And if there was something that I'd like to see going forward, as we hear from Pam Ronald, geneticist, and her husband, Raul Adamchek, organic farmer, is the yes and, right? Some people, the, the artwork, we're very proud of it, but it does seem to be pitting, you know, GMO versus organic. We use that very much as a striking image to try and sell the film, but the people that made it a GMO versus organic conversation was mostly the organic industry. I've never seen a GMO farmer holding up a sign saying, don't grow organically, never, ever. In the, in, at all. So, sorry, to put that aside, I want to embrace the yes and of it, right? That you can grow a GMO seed organically if you choose to do that. But let's have the whole conversation about that. And then one other piece about labeling, um, I, I, I'm troubled by the labeling piece. I completely get why you wanted to get out in front of it and have it labeled. What's frustrated me, and I think that probably would have been the right time to do it, what frustrates me about it is are the people that use the labeling argument to say, look, they don't want to be transparent. And then I see some of those same people not being transparent. Vermont was a state, some people were very proud in Vermont, that they were going to be the first state to label GMOs before it became a 
national labeling conversation under Obama. And one of the things that really showed the, the cards for me about why some people wanted to have the label was when they grandfathered in the entire dairy industry. No GMO labeling on that dairy industry. Why? Because that industry didn't want to have the skull and crossbones of GMO. And they allowed that. So where is the real transparency? So that's my frustration. What I want to see is actually what Obama said, too, is it have a QR code. It's very expensive, but you can know the carbon footprint. You can know anything you want about You can know if your organic apple, how much copper sulfate was used to, to, to grow your organic apple. So I just want to see real transparency, not just GMO transparency with, with the labeling. Thank you for answering the question. It does make me wonder if, if some of the some of the items that you that at the end of the film were shown, so the oranges and the peanuts, the, and the and um, what was the last one that was coming down the pipe? Um, mosquitoes mm. that are sort of coming down the pipe. Maybe if if those had been maybe out at the outset, there there might have been a different um, consumer opinion versus the products that were first coming out that were. BT or well, they, they were, were very far grown up ready. Yeah. They were very farmer serving and, and, and not really resonating with the general public. And it, there would have been a much different conversation. Absolutely. Anyways, um, we have another person at the microphone. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm actually a vertical farmer in Toronto. Um, I'd like to start by saying I don't really give a shit about organic. Thank you. Um, I, I actually, the, the, the true key word here is traceability, and that's a whole other documentary. So but is, is what's the key word? Traceability. Traceability. But we won't get into that today. Um, also, really respect our soil farmers. I, I, I truly, uh, you guys do a lot of work, um, probably even a lot more than me. Um, but I, I have a question for you. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, if you could go back, if the stars align, if you could go back to your grandfather's way of farming, uh, to the no-till farming, the crop cover, um, would you uh, would you do that? And would you agree that it's more sustainable in the long term? Your soil is more healthy. You get a better product. You actually have less pests. Yeah, I would. Uh, thanks for the question. I personally, I would, I would disagree with that. If I went back to the way my my grandfather farmed, uh, I still utilize all the tools that he used in his cropping system, as far as having green cover crops uh, 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 in off seasons and, and utilizing uh, the the, t the tools that he used. And I have the opportunity now to add other tools to the to the mix in in doing that. Um, uh, do do I have more pests? Uh, uh, probably. But not nothing to do with the way I'm farming. That's just the natural evolution of, of other living things. Uh, that that that's what happens. Um, and when we talk about a sustainability, um, uh, no, I, I I don't think that uh, that it, we have this this dream and vision that what we did and how we did it 60 or 100 years ago was the right way to do it. I don't think we actually understand how uh, economically depressed. Uh, agriculture was in some of those uh, some of those time periods, and uh, they really you know scraped by and and only could do what they could do. Um, I think with the advent and, and the adoption of technology in agriculture that we have now, actually, we're we're, we're I wouldn't tell you know my never I, my grandfather passed away quite a while ago, and I would never say it, but I think we're better farmers than they were back then. Uh, and I think, and that's just maybe we're the same in every industry that we're maybe better than what we were before, and that's what we want to strive to be. So hopefully I answered your question. And, and I'm going to add one, one question for, for you guys. Well, I know on, on the farm that I grew up on t today, um, we probably do the least amount of tillage that we've ever done on our farm going back as many generations as I can think. Now, potato production is a different operation, but I don't know if you'd consider your farm when your grandfather had it to be no-till. Yeah, no, actually, there, there, there was no no-till didn't exist uh, back then. Uh, No-till is something that we had, that the industry adopted really 60s, 70s, and then again, in, and it went away for a while, uh, and and it's been came back in the 90s. Uh, the utilization of of uh, GMO uh, crops uh, actually allowed me to adopt more no-till into my uh, cropping system, and now three quarters of the crops that I grow are grown in no-till. Any one field that I farm only gets worked maybe once every five years. All the other times uh, I, I, I no-till into that crop, I incorporate green manure crops where I grow a, a crop of red clover and, and uh, let, it, uh, let it die and, and, and incorporate it back into the soil. Uh, so there's lots of all these other tools. Um, and, and before we had Roundup Ready soybeans, uh, when I grew soybeans in Ontario, the, uh, um, the chemicals that we were using to control weeds weren't working anymore. Uh, so uh, I was having to adopt more tillage. 
Uh, so I had to work every acre of, of, uh, of ground I was going to plant soybeans on. I might have to work it two or three times, which really destroys the soil structure. And then to, to control the weeds in crop, I might have to spray it two or three or four times, and I still might not have uh, full control. And then in order to harvest properly, I'd have to go in and, and kill the weeds down before I could drive the combine through it. Uh, and so with the adoption of Roundup Ready uh, soybeans, uh, I was able to control weeds better, uh, get a no-till system back up and running, which then reduced the amount of uh, weed pressure that I would have in a field at, uh, in, at any one time or any one year. Um, and, and it's not to say that I have to spray my crops with Roundup when I grow a Roundup Ready crop. What it does is give me the opportunity to use that tool. If uh, the weather conditions and, and the, the field conditions dictate that I need to use it, I will, uh, but I'm, you know it costs money. So why would I spend money on something that I don't need? So I'll, I'll assess the need and then and utilize the tool that makes sense. Uh, in my view, that platform no longer exists. Where my forefathers used to grow food no longer exists on this planet because uh, even our water is polluted. Uh, we have less oxygen in the air than we, our forefathers had. Many things have changed. So that platform will never ever exist. So there is no going back. From mining, from the chimneys generating uh, 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 electricity, and all of that. Those things, did we have it? Did we have them uh, maybe a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago? I don't know how far back your forefathers sent it over to you, but uh, history tells of 1800s. So, is there such a platform moving back a thousand years, maybe? Um, what, just one, just to follow up on that, we had a question from the audience, and the links in was sort of already half, half answered by you, Greg. But um, the audience member was asking um, if you are growing GM crops and non-GM crops on your on your land, um, how do you decide when and where? And so, if we believe that GM is is most useful, why don't we just use it all? So in, this, in the context of your farm, how do you make that decision? Uh, we can grow GM grains alongside conventional yeah. and without cross-pollinating because the very system we use to grow yellow and white maize in South Africa is enough for me to produce GM and non-GM. The timing is important. Yes. Yeah, and and on my farm for uh, for making the decision on whether I grow a GM crop or non non a non GMO crop, uh, the first thing is what is what is the need on that farm, and it's it's really basically on a business decision. Um, absolutely, some non GMO stuff is worth uh, uh, more money if you can harvest it in in good quality and sell it into a premium market. Uh, so you make that business decision to say. Uh, do I need the tools on this farm or this piece of land uh, that uh, GMO crop would, would help me uh, grow a better, more sustainable crop? If so, absolutely use it. If not, is there an opportunity where I could grow something that's higher value and, and make a premium on it? Well, then that would be a business decision that I would make. Uh, realistically, on my farm, that, that, that instance of being able to get a premium for a non-GMO existed a lot more 10 years ago than it does now. So now when I, when I make those analysis on a year-to-year -year basis to say what should I grow, uh, uh, I grow more and more uh, genetically modified uh, crops, GMO crops, because that's what the business uh, model tells me to do. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Um, I remember in terms of communication on, uh, by the industry that the challenge was that there was nothing from the early products for the consumer. And so maybe you can comment on that because at the end of the day, the benefits even now are vastly for the, the farming community. Therefore, you needed farmers to talk about it in a positive way. But my other question is around the labeling because 
I understand it that uh, Health Canada has not approved labeling per se because what does it mean? What does labeling GMO free mean? Um, so I'd like a comment about that. And that's why it hasn't uh, moved forward. Um, in fact, it just reminds me, I, took, I was in Loblaws a lot and I see all of their bread from Ace is labeled GMO free. Oh, and I love those crackers so much. What? <laughs> Where could yeah. you? I mean, What'd you say? I love those crackers so much. Yeah. <laughs> it hurt, it, it well, literally hurt. And I, I, I don't know whether they're GMO free, but all of their bread is GMO free. No, the crackers so, are too. So I've too. asked people, why is it GMO free? Because there are no wheat varieties that I'm aware of where the technology is used. So of course it's GMO free. And it's a great example of how misleading that can be. Gluten-free potato chips? <laughs> GMO-free salt? I think that, that that's a good point. Ray, the, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> I, I remember one of the first... This is, this is Ray, Ray Mowling, who uh, worked for Monsanto for many years. And I'm um, very, very pleased to have you here this evening. It's good to be here. Wouldn't miss it. I, I kind of say there's, there's a couple of different elements to that, but I, I remember... The, the idea of lab, absence labeling isn't, isn't a new thing. It's been around, and I remember coming from Potato Farm, and the first time we saw it was cholesterol-free French fries. And I remember my dad going, I was like, well, that's not hard. There's no cholesterol in French fries anyway. <laughs> so that, that's an easy label. So, so we, and that was back in the early 80s before we got into the kind of the how many does not contain stickers can you put on a label, right? That, that's a value proposition now. And, and as much as that might be, Troublesome. I do also sympathize with those that are trying to market a product in a really competitive marketplace. So I'm really glad I don't have to make those decisions. Um, but we should make those decisions. Yeah, it, it, we, just we, to remove all of them and start over. Make something that's good and safe and delicious and let us choose to, 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 to buy it or not. It's very kind of you to have sympathy for them in a competitive marketplace. And it is very competitive uh, across the board. But... It's just, a, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. The consumers, the consumers, are, consumers need direction. We're increasingly distanced from our food supply, and, and that is not changing. More and more people But I don't are think those labels are giving them direction. Well, no. That's the problem. I agree with you completely on the direction, but let's give them really good information instead of them giving them confusing information. Uh, um, but just to go, I think but, but the, the first element of the question was on the Distance. early communication. What, what, what's the answer to a better communication when all of the early products, in fact, I, I don't know of any products right now. The Flavor Saver Tomato was an attempt at that, longer shelf life, etc. But yeah. there's no products that I'm aware of that actually have... A, specifically a consumer benefit. Potato. Yeah, maybe, I, th I think there's two well, there's apples. I could, I could challenge that because if there were no papayas, as they have in the, then, then the, the price of the papayas from the uh, countries that didn't have that virus would be much higher. So there is a yeah. consumer benefit from the Hawaiian papaya. Right, but, but the taste of a papaya is the same. Well, that's what yeah. I was getting at. Yeah. In other words, the economic impact of saving the papaya was an economic impact. And most people have no idea that that happened in Hawaii. That's, that's right. right. That's right. That's right. And, and they, don't, they don't need any herbicides at all. The flavor saver tomato, I understand, was a bit of a misnomer. Uh, they said there wasn't much flavor there to say. Right. <laughs> it was supposed to be delicious as a, as a pasta sauce, I was told. Well, it was picked a little early, you see, yeah. uh, to keep the sort of furnace, right. and that there was a flavor trade-off. But that's, and its, its flavor was increased with heat, which is why it made a very good tomato paste. But it wasn't a good eating tomato. <laughs> but I think there is, there's a couple examples coming, and I, I think... You heard Greg's example of how he makes a decision on his farm, so why there's a benefit. And that benefit keeps food costs down, it keeps food production, it makes it more sustainable. But exactly to what you're saying, that's hard to explain to someone who, not of no fault of their own, hasn't spent any time on a farm. Like, not everybody can spend time on a farm. So we've done a poor job of trying to explain that. I think, in essence, it's hard to explain, period, because it's so far down the ladder before that, that benefit hits. But the couple of products that are coming out is the, um, the Arctic Apple, um, which is invented by Okanagan Specialty Fruits out of BC. So this is an apple where you can cut it, and if you know if you take a bite out of an apple, you cut it, you leave it on the table, and it turns brown, 
in like 20 minutes and then no one wants to eat it because it looks really ugly. Well, the Arctic apple used genetic engineering to essentially turn off that browning color. So if you want, you could cut your apples on Sunday night, put them in your fridge, and all week you could put them in your lunches and they wouldn't go brown. So there's a consumer trait where someone can actually see what is it, what's in it, why should I embrace this, why should I try these in my home? And then the potato is a similar technology where if you drop a potato and then you boil it, it gets that black spot on it that looks really ugly. You get a lot of food waste through that. Same thing with the apple, you get a lot of food waste. So with the non-browning uh, potato, they're saying it's about 20 to 30% less food waste when it comes to how, that's how much potatoes get banged around between when they get from my clumsy hands at the farm all the way through to the, the chef at the end of the day. And the chef gets a benefit from it because the one thing a chef doesn't have much of is space in their restaurant. So if you've got to have 130 pounds of potatoes to get 100 pounds of servable potatoes, but I could tell you I can just deliver you 100 pounds and you'll get 100 pounds, that's a big deal for a chef. So the, these kind of traits I think will make a difference. And, and I think along with that, the banana that was discussed on the film has a story that resonates better than making it easier for a farmer to grow soybeans, which is hard. It's hard to make that connection. And, and, yeah. Thanks. Uh. I, I have a question here from the audience. Um, and I kind of, I like, I, I appreciate this one. To the director. I'm following you out. Um, thank you for making the people on the non-GMO side look like morons. <laughs> Which, okay. Did you thank me for that? Yeah, well, is there a sarcasm a emoticon with that, or is yeah. that a... Um, which, you know, it, I think is a fair fair point. I also, I grew up in, for the last 10 years, I've been in, in the organic side of things, in a town that is designated GE-free. Um, and, and I don't think I look like those people, but so there are other people out there that are questioning or cynical or skeptical. That, so, so, so why is it, just is there focus on? Is that, oh, that there's was, another one for the panel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a it question. Was it was a, a statement. It was a statement to the director. Do you thank want to you respond? for making the people in the <laughs> look like morons. Okay. Um, was that snarky? I guess that was snarky. Okay. Uh, was not my goal to make anyone look like a moron. Were there things that people who are anti-GMO or anti-science say that can sound ridiculous. Yes. Can they make me laugh in the editing room? Yes. Is humor a tool that I use as a storyteller? Yes. Um, so that was the, the, the purpose of it. I used their own words to communicate what they clearly wanted to communicate, and sometimes it's funny. So um, I tried my best to treat everybody in the film as honestly as I understood them, right, with my experience. My definition of a documentary is the adaptation of the truth, right? And some people would hear, oh, adaptation, what do you mean? It's an adaptation. Of course it's an adaptation. A documentary, some people think a documentary is magically the truth. There's, it's all an adaptation. Now the question is, how hard do I work to try and keep that truth as real as possible. That is who that person is. These, is the, this is the, these are the facts. This is the data as truthful as possible. So there has been some people that have been frustrated by that. I would also say to people that are frustrated by that, many of the people you see in the film are the top of the pyramid in terms of the anti-GMO communicators. And that's not, and that's not my fault. I, I might just, I, I think that's an excellent point that, um, the key, the key people focus on the film are the communicators of, of this anti-movement, and, and I think there's a difference between those people. There's also those who market organic products, which is another element that has moments. I, I will say it that way. But then there's organic farmers, and I think you'll notice in the film that nobody's going after an organic farmer for making a business choice. Emma, Emma's an organic grow. farmer. Raul's an organic farmer. Yeah, it, it, so, so I think sometimes when we say organic industry, all of these people get lumped in, but um, like Jeffrey Smith is not the organic industry. He's a, a leader of an anti-movement. So I, I, I wouldn't want to get the feeling that we're, we're lumping all elements of people who work in this space into one giant ball. But what's highlighted here 
it's yeah. it's pretty good adaptation from what I've experienced. <laughs> the audience is never wrong. So. Yeah. Can't change somebody's <laughs> feeling about how the movie made them feel, and that's completely there, valid for them to feel that way. Wonderful. I do still wonder when they were not. This wasn't yours, but it was sure. the clip that came where they were interviewing the people at the farmers market. What does GMO stand for? Sure. That went around the internet a whole bunch, and I, I wondered how many people they interviewed to get those stupid people's clips. But anyways, stupid responses. Um, yeah. I don't know. Okay. It was curious. Um, question to the to the panel: If if Monsanto, Dupont, Bayer, these are big. Um, Egg technology companies um, fund the science. How can the results be unbiased? Can you go against the entity that signs your paycheck? Excellent question. That sounds somewhat directed at me, I think. I think, I think, it's, I think it's you. Uh, so, so I think it's a very relevant question. Um, how can you trust the science coming from a company that has a vested interest in the success of the product? I think that's a very realistic and, and Anyone would have that question, whether it's Nike shoes or uh, Volkswagen emission tests. Thank you, Volkswagen. Um, or any company that's doing their own science. But this is how science, uh, this is how government regulation uh, is approached in any industry. You make requirements, strict requirements on the industry to produce data. You verify that data. You check it to make sure that they are providing the honest data. And then you don't only accept that data but you look at independent science that is not funded by the industry that has no, if you want to call it conflict of interest or no association. So the bodies that were highlighted in the film are not only making this determination based on the studies that are completed by, the, by these large companies, but they're looking at all the science around the world. And those 2,000 studies, I think it's half of them or more are independent studies. I have to look up the numbers specifically. Um, so those bodies, those global scientific bodies that are independent don't make those kind of statements lightly. Those are very serious statements that the integrity of their scientific organizations are part of. So I think it's, that's why you can have faith that when Health Canada or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or the FAO or the World Health Organization comes out with one of these statements that it's, it is a rigorous decision. And for the second question, can you make a decision that goes against your paycheck? Um, and my paycheck is one that's paid by both those companies. I believe that my scientific integrity comes first. I wouldn't work in this space if I didn't see the science behind these products. And I think one of my jobs is, on behalf of the industry, if there is a problem, that I'm there to raise the flag and help the industry figure out how to deal with it. And one that's a, a legitimate issue, and it was somewhat touched on the film, is weeds can become resistant to pesticides. And you'll hear super weeds and things like this as you go forward. Weed resistance didn't begin when genetically modified crops came on the market. Did the advent of Roundup Ready crops uh, accentuate weed resistance problems in Roundup, like Rob Fraley said? Yes. But now we have to solve that problem, figure out the new agronomic practices to deal with them, and continue to move forward. So when problems arise, we deal with them. But the core science of the safety of this food is very rigorous, and they Health Canada and the CFI wouldn't have put these products forward if they didn't have absolute confidence that they're safe. And if I, if I, yeah, if I could take that a bit further, again, as a, as a father looking at this, at this situation as, and as, as a journalist, I don't, it, and it, on first blanche, you hear industry funded science and you go, ouch, scary, can I trust it? The beauty of science, now that goes in both directions. Directions. We gave Charles Benbrook a very hard time because he was making studies that I think the evidence showed that he was failing at the scientific method. He was asked to promise results, and he promised results. That's the fail. Not that he was funded by the organic industry. I don't have a problem if Whole Foods funds a study, as long as they allow them to not promise the results. And the beauty of the scientific method is it repeatable? So if Charles Bendrick does a study that he finds out that one time organic milk was 0.00002% more protein than non-organic milk, that's not, that's a single, that's single study syndrome. You need to repeat that and God forbid that you have more definitive results than 0.00002. So you get, you get my point. It's, and as a journalist, it's also the 
conflict of interest versus perceived conflict of interest. If some people have had called me a, a propagandist making this film, and that was very hurtful and, and frustrating. And I say back to them, show me the data that supports that, right? And they've been very quiet when I ask them that. Many of them have never even seen the film. So there, we have to really distinguish between perceived conflict of interest and real conflict of interest, or I can't read the Washington Post, I can't read the New York Times, on and on and on. Not that all of those institutions don't have imperfections as well, but look at the batting average. And so I've said enough. I'd also like to comment on the length of time it takes to develop these products as uh, the scientists who developed the Hawaiian papaya, rainbow papaya, mentioned it took seven years for them to make sure that the sequence was correct and repeatable. That was seven years. Then they had to start their crop trials. And we heard in Africa that that one lady th was ready to uh, to buy that product for her own farm, but they, they said, we'd like you're still two to four years away from getting that approved. The Arctic apple that um, Ian mentioned uh, was just approved last year, I believe, as either 2016, 2017 by Health Canada. Uh, they thought they were ready for Health Canada in 2006, and they weren't. They still had to do more work. So they had already at that point defined their sequence and were doing crop trials. So that gives you an indication of the length of time it takes to commercialize this technology. And, uh, and uh, there's, uh, there's all sorts of information on Health Canada's website under Nawful Foods as to the methods that they use to assess crops, uh, genetically modified crops. And once you get to Health Canada, they say it could take seven years. Hey, yeah, I'm not just holding up the microphone stand. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of my biggest concerns is this organic other divide. I like the pursuit of organic. I think they mean they want to pursue sustainability, you know, healthier for the soil, healthier, healthier for the environment. I'd love to hear from all the panelists, and partly because, Scott, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard that part of your pursuit of this film was because your tribe, your California community, and California is an interesting state, for sure, we, we, we pay attention to it, um, was, was organic, was anti-GM, was, was this. And, and you, kind of like Mark Linus, had this, this need to figure out the science. But from Kelly on down, I, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on how we divide this, this adequate picture here, the fracture for the organic industry using good technology to achieve the goals that I think, again, at the heart of the issue, we all want, and that's sustainable, healthy, nutritious food. In one or two sentences. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think the film did a good job of saying, yeah, we are sort of arguing for the same things, we're all in pursuit of the same things. And um, living in Pell River for the past 10 years, which is on the coast of BC, and it, and it designated GE free city um, was really interesting because I was surrounded by um, all farmers who were who were fully in support of the local food local food movement the alternative food movement and and organic naturally and um, and I am a, a complete 100% proponent of that movement as well um, but I felt that the that being part of that meant that I also had to be anti-GM, and I don't, and I'm not pro-GM either. But there is no there. What I don't like about this debate so far, in the past few decades that we've been debating it, <laughs> is that there is no room for this. Like, there's no room for uh, for discussing the the complexity and and where it's appropriate and where it might not be, and and where is the gray area. And it's it it really has always felt for me to be either you're for or against. Um, and so that's been my frustration. Okay. So um, I'm going to slightly disagree with you. Uh, not disagree with your, Excellent. not disagree with your intentions, not disagree with your intentions, not disagree with what you find attractive about organic farming. But again, there is no one who would be on the other side of that divide. So if you're saying organic and non-organic, yep. I've never seen anybody that doesn't grow organic saying stop growing organic. I have seen people on the organic side saying stop, grow G stop growing GMO. 
stop using your pesticides, but our pesticides are okay. So I'm speaking in broad terms. There are a lot of organic farmers that have excellent intentions and make beautiful products. There's a lot of organic marketers that have used this communication to say, that's evil food, and it's going to poison your children and poison the planet, and here's God's food, and it's beautiful and it's pure. And they've been incredibly successful at selling that, and that is an oversimplification at best and evil marketing at worst. Some, some, okay? So I don't want to remove organic farming as an option. You, again, Emma's an organic farmer in the film. Raul, Pam and Raul, are, are, he's an organic farmer, and they want to find a sustainable choice. So my other question to you would be what you like about organic farming. If you could snap your fingers and say, I want an all-organic planet, would, would you want that? Me? Yes. No. Why not? In fact, our family farm is not even certified organic okay. for a number of reasons as well that just don't make sense in that, in that context. Good. So our neighbor is certified organic. As a result, it, we do some contracting for him. As a result, he can't use Roundup to spray his weeds, so we have to go in and plow his land, turn it all over so that the, the weed seeds die in the sun, and then, and then till it all up and then and cultivate and replant again. That, my, my dad goes, gets so frustrated with how much diesel fumes and fossil fuels are being used. Sure. Because he's certified organic, he can't just put on a little bit of topical application of Roundup. Yes, and, and. exactly. So, so, so that's just one example of, of where we need to, there's just so much complexity in each farm and each practice is, is different. And these, like, like Greg was saying earlier, you have a, a, a toolkit that's, right. that's available to you. And, and there's just no way to be on one side or, or the other fully. Well, if I would just call the one side, use the best information yeah. you have okay, to side. do the best farming that you can. That's yeah. the side <laughs> for me. But. Yeah. Organic food started out of a necessity. It's become an ideology. It's here to stay. It uh, became a necessity. It started actually in UK after, the, after World War II, where they didn't have any chemicals. It was a very, very poor country. They didn't have chemicals to help farmers grow. They had to find other methods. And, that, and, so, and Lady, Lady, uh, Lord, Lady Mountbatten was very involved in the um, start of the organic uh, sector industry. So that's where it grew. By the time, uh, say, genetically modified food came along, that's when everything people were starting to think about, well, how is my food growing? And I think we can thank genetically modified for getting people to, uh, raising some awareness. I never thought of that before. How is my food growing? Um, the organic sector has learned a lot. Uh, a number of universities, we saw that uh, University of California has an organic sector. It took a long time for University of Guelph to get organic being taught to, to students. Because prior to that, it was all trial and error. So talk about safety or food safety. They didn't even know at to what temperature they should be um, incinerating manure and use that manure as a, as a fertilizer. So. It is becoming a lot more um, um, subjected to rules, their own rules. There is uh, some trials and being done. It's always going to be with us, I believe. It's a huge sector. Um, it's growing all the time. But I think also uh, an important part of organic, there's some work being done at University of Ottawa uh, by the um, uh, Telford School of Management which, yes, I did graduate from there, from there, which is why I know about this. But what I find interesting about this work being done at the University of Ottawa is it's not a university associated with any agricultural uh, practices. So it's very um, unbiased and very independent. And what they're finding out in studying the organic consumer is when there's very little brand loyalty. As long as it's organic, that's fine. But the other thing they're finding out is these people are very uh, mistrustful. And they want to be as close as possible to the source of the food. In fact, some of the people who are closest to the source of the food, who, let's say, belong to co-ops, are those who are most mistrustful. So there's something there that organic food is, is, is fulfilling for these people. And the basis, according to this University of Ottawa study, is this matter, matter of, of trust. And perhaps I like the point that you make, that yes, they're never telling anyone not to grow uh, organic. I think that could be something that 
this idea then of mistrust, if they would listen to that message and that perspective, that might help them become more assured. And we're just running a little bit low on time, so <laughs> just going to try to speed up our responses. Uh, <clears throat> growing organic food or non-organic, to me, is a bit of uh, confusion. Is it about how you feed your plant or is it an organic uh, plant? How does it differ from a GMO in, in producing food? Is a, <clears throat> how do I put it? You can grow GM seeds using organic matter to feed the plant. Or do you people producing organic food, are you not using uh, 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 other kinds of fertilizers at all? and pesticides. What's the difference when you look at uh, 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 the periodic table? What's the difference in, 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 in producing that kind of food? Uh, and, and what's your concern about synthetic chemicals versus organic chemicals? You got to be get more. Okay, we'll get more specific outside. We'll get more specific outside. And you have concerns about toxic chemicals yeah. and manure being used in organic farming as well, correct? For those same purposes. The manure. More or less. Okay. Or, or, or much less, but do you both use? Chemicals. You're using less if you use. Uh, okay. All right. Can you? Uh, and then I don't want to, to be man on man, but uh, I, I'd love to have answers, really. Uh, if you're not using chemicals, what can you use to do 100 hectares? How much compost do you need? Emma does the same. Yes, yeah. yeah, you can do. He's not soil farming. Eh? He's not soil farming. He's, which he's, is a he's great, not farming in which soil. Which is a great he's choice. Aquaculture. And no one, I, know, I don't think anyone in this room wants to stop you from, from, from that choice. The question is, should we all get on that bus? Or should you be choosing that bus? And we should have lots of different buses. I'm thinking a lot of people in this room would like to get on a bus to go somewhere with, that has food at this point. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just a couple of quick comments from my perspective, uh, organic farming versus uh, conventional farming. Um, I think that they're both great business models, and I think if somebody can uh, can uh, grow a product and somebody's willing to pay a premium for it, uh, I think that's that's good for them, good business. I, I have a, you know a bunch of friends that are organic farmers, and, and they, they do a good job of, of, of managing their crops and, and growing their uh, grow, uh, managing their land and what they do. Um, I think the challenge we have is right from our marketing standpoint in North America that uh, that they've they've unfortunately there are people who will say negative things about about uh, conventional farming um, and uh, and uh, you know free free speech. They're they're welcome to have their opinion, but I don't want necessarily everyone. Uh, uh, to be t take that as the truth. Uh, I think if you really want to understand organic farming, you need to actually pick a product and pick a country that it came from and understand the practices that were used to grow that organic crop. Because I don't know if, uh, personally, uh, but I suspect that, that in some countries, uh, in some organic systems, there are uh, practices that they use that we wouldn't necessarily in Canada think that would be an organic practice and if and if and if not that's great i think that that uh, that's uh, but from a consumer standpoint i think if you really want to understand and 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 believe that what you're buying is a better product you actually need to do the research uh, to figure out is that exactly doing what you want it to do um, and there's lots of good business models out there for all different types of farming and i think that we should uh, do whatever works for you and makes you money and and it all helps feed the world I think just for, for me, um, I think it's unfortunate as an agricultural scientist that we've put a fence around organic practices and conventional practices. 
they're just farming practices from a scientific point of view, and I think the research being done by the uh, organic professor here is extremely important. Those things can be integrated into agricultural practice. So to me, the marketing fence has crept into our science lens, and that, that bothers me as a scientist. We should be funding farming research in all spaces to be used in all kinds of farming. So I think that's good for me. I think we've had a gentleman that's been very patient. Can, do we have to go <laughs> I'm just waiting okay. for the yes. Last. This, is, this has to be the last question. All that right. You've been standing for a long time. Yes, so let's. I really want you to get to. Yes, let's. <laughs> what was that idea? Okay, so just <laughs> if anybody wants to comment and if everybody would like to comment, that would be great. I, Other than this film, what should our next steps be in educating the public? Because I came here without a lot of knowledge about GMOs. I still had a single question in my head when it was all said and done, and I'll talk to that uh, outside. But my question to you is, how do we get everybody to know what I saw here in this film tonight? What a great question. That's a the really good question. The film is currently available on... Uh, yeah, so, so you did say other than this film, and it's a, it's a very good question. Um, uh, think twice. A wonderful book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And we have two types of thinking as human beings. Type one is more instinctual, using our gut, and it got us a long way from caveman till now. And type two is more analytical. So if type one is GMO bad, organic good, forgive the binary again, but simple. Type two is what you just so beautifully described. Think twice, case by case. There's an incredible TED talk by uh, one of the heads of the World Wildlife Fund where he uses two words to talk about sustainability. It depends. Look at the whole picture. So at a cocktail party, on your social media feed, ask people to think twice. I'll maybe go... Yeah, that, that was great. But I think along those lines... I'll Kind of shooting from the hip here because I think you asked a question I hadn't thought of before, and it's a really good question. Um, I don't think that the industry trying to communicate to the general public is going to solve that problem. It's a part of it. We have to be transparent and get the information out there, but we inherently will not be the number one credible voice in this space. People will always have to that question about the science. There'll be a little bit of, okay, that's what they said, but what do other people say? So to that point, I think what we have to do is we have to teach critical thinking in schools at a younger age. So that when someone hears something like, GMOs cause autism, someone might go, that sounds pretty drastic. I'm gonna look for, I, I, I have the tools to know where to find neutral information. And I think that's what's not being taught right now or taught enough, or we could help get that taught more. Because if you equip people to do that, not just in this space, but that conversation will fuel itself because people will go and search out neutral information by which to make their point. And then if you do have the science on your side, the right decisions will be made. So I don't know if I dodged the question there, but that's my... That's, and if I can, I know it's late, but Neil, that's Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I listen is to him a lot. One of the first people that I've ever heard articulate, there's lots of different defenses of the importance of science and education. But he was the first one that, that pointed out exactly what you just said, which is teaching the scientific method, not just science dissecting a frog, different elements of science, but using the scientific method to make decisions in the science classroom in the, every part of your life. So um, that's the next phase of, of the film for us as well, is going from middle schools through colleges to try and really change that. And last thing, I might make a food series called Food Fraud that's gonna try and scientifically vet all the food documentaries, all the food diet books, and really just not every single one of them, of course. But I was gonna say, that's a full career. It's, a, it's uh, yes. Yeah. They're I'll have that fast. finished in about 30 years, everybody. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's a wonderful um, topic to close on. Uh, we do have other questions, but we are going to stick around in the, uh, in the lobby and chat with, with you, so come up to any of us who you think is the coolest to chat with. Um, yeah. um, but um, really, Thanks, thank everybody. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you.